Hi, I'm Peggy Fair, and thanks for watching the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today, we're going to talk about macro photography with the fabulous Steve Gettle. But first, I want to be sure that you sign up for our mailing list, and it's really easy to do. Go to our website, understandphotography.com and sign up for one of our freebies. One thing that's popular right now, we have 30 unique and practical gifts for photographers. We also have um, essential travel photography tips. Um, I'm losing my, I've lost my brain. I can't think of what else is on there. What kind of camera do I buy? What do I need to learn to be a proficient photographer? That's a real popular one. So you can go on our website, mm -hmm. understandphotography.com, and download one of the freebies. Please be sure to like, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, write us a review on YouTube or pod, as a, on iTunes. It's really, really helpful. So we appreciate it. So today my guest is Steve Gettle. Now Steve is an amazing photographer. I met him this summer. We both spoke at a conference up in Michigan. And welcome, Steve. Thank you. And you live in Michigan, right? I do live in Michigan. And I live in a little town called Howell, Mich Howell Michigan. Howell, Michigan. Which Isn't is there where that TV Arbor. actress was the... Oh, yeah. Jeff Daniels has, has a theater there. Is that oh, what you're thinking no, of? No, it was a girl, a woman, the little house on the prairie lady. Oh. Wasn't she? Didn't she run for something? Well, I'm not but aware. But he does, but... Uh, what, but it Jeff was, Daniels is... He does? Yeah. I didn't know that. He's, he's from Chelsea, but close enough. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Give like, Jeff Daniels a plug. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I like him. Yeah, he's good. Now, you're, you are a very diverse photographer in general, right? Well, I, I, as far as nature photography, everything I do is nature photography. Okay, but, but, but I you, do everything. I do landscapes, I do birds, I do uh, mammals, and macro photography. I love to do macro photography as well. Okay, do you have a favorite subject? Probably birds, followed closely by macro photography. Well, you're in the right place, hopefully. Although you said you went to Ding Darling, there weren't any birds, right? There were some. Or no, yeah, but bird rookery. Really, bird really. rookery. Yeah, bird the, the one with the bird in it. There right, were no that birds. was a little slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we got on some, some good spoonbills today and uh, some of the other herons and things. It was good. That's yeah, awesome. At we Ding have, Darling. We have amazing birds, and you got the white pelicans, too. We did have I white pelicans them. as well, yeah. Because they were here for a very short time. So. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right, so I'm going to go completely off photography for a minute. I want to hear your life story, but the short version as it applies to photography. Oh, okay. Well, the short um, version. I've always been a nature guy, love nature, so I started taking pictures to kind of just show people the things that I saw out in the woods and now, fields and forests. Now, are you from, like, out in the country like that? Um, like I grew up in Kalamazoo, so it's kind of southeast Michigan, not, okay. not real rural, but... Uh, but I've always been out in the forests and fields and things like that. And then I started taking pictures just to show people the things that I saw, and it kind of went from there. Ah. Yeah. And now I do, Nicole and I do tours all over the world. I've got an agent who sells things to books and magazines and calendars, and I'm making a living doing something I love. That's awesome. How great is that? Yeah. All right, now I have something else I want to ask you because I love this story. How did you meet Nicole? Oh, well, that's a funny story. So. <laughs> We met at the funniest event ever. It's called Mothapalooza. Moth? A palooza. Mothapalooza. Right. Mothapalooza is a gathering of all the moth people in the in the United States. And it's are up you in a Ohio. moth person? I'm really not. I, I have this crazy contraption that I use to photograph moths in flight. And it uses an electromagnetic shutter, uh, laser beams high-speed flashes and the birds or the moths fly through and they take their own picture and it's really kind of a cool thing and I was there to demonstrate that and okay. and Nicole is just a She's loves nature and a total naturalist so she was in, in, interested in learning about more about moths so she was there with some of her friends and so the rest is history. Girl. She's a moth girl and among moth people she really stuck out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah she caught my eye across the street yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah. How did so? What happened? You had a booth, and she came. Well, no, no, we we actually or? had cabins across from each other. I think she did it on purpose, but I'm not ah, really sure. She saw that cute guy and said, "That was that's Put exactly that my cabin. story." <laughs> <laughs> I love so, that. So yeah, and, and then we, she ended up moving to Michigan with you. Yeah, we just bought a house in Howell. We've got 10 acres. It backs up to 6,000 acres of state land, which is really awesome. We're going to start a, a place up there called the Nature Photography Institute. We're going to lead workshops, macro photography workshops, bird photography workshops, and printing workshops, all kinds of things like that. So it's really exciting. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. What are you going to do in the winter? 
we're going to do exactly that. Ah. Your photography doesn't stop just because it gets cold out. I know we're in Florida, but... does for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not completely true, but I don't... You know, everybody with the craze go to Iceland, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's cold in Iceland. <laughs> the snow is pretty, and all the birds and all the mammals have their best coats on and their best plumage in, and it's, it's, it's fun stuff. That's Plus, all the owls come down, and... Oh yeah. Do you have yeah. snowy owls in Michigan? We have, yeah. They migrate down. Great Those gray owls, hawk owls, aren't they something? I love, that. I've never seen one in real life. I've just See, seen pictures. And you guys had some that came all the way down to Florida a couple of years ago. There was a big eruption and there were even some that down, came all the way down as far as Florida. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Probably not this far. We don't even get sandhill cranes. Oh yeah, this crane. is south We don't Florida. even get sandhill cranes down this far. Right. So it's kind of a bummer, but everything else is down here, so that's kind of cool. So, yeah. All right, so let's talk about macro photography. I assume you're going to have macro photography workshops too there. We are. We have <laughs> beautiful meadow to do that, yeah. That's awesome. So let's talk about what, what kind of gear first. What, what do I need to take macro? And macro photography is close-up photography, right? Right, yeah. Macro photography is basically the photography of small things. So we're going to talk about nature photography today, but it applies to anything. If you want to photograph stamps or watch parts or small machine parts, things like that, it's all, it, everything we talk about today is going to apply to everything, not only nature photography. And but you know, one of the things we've done several private lessons for is jewelers. Sure, absolutely. They always want to learn how to photograph their jewelry, so absolutely. this is a good Good right. episode for them too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and one of the things that I really love about macro photography is it doesn't require a lot of equipment. You can buy a macro lens, a DSLR, and a good tripod and be a world-class macro photographer. You don't have to travel all over the world. You don't have to have a $10,000 lens. It's really, the threshold to get into it is really pretty low. And it's really creative and fun and exciting. So, Now, do um, you have a lens that you recommend to start? Sure. Yeah, I uh, I actually do use two lenses. I have there's so a macro a macro lens is a lens that basically will go down and take a full frame picture of a nickel. Most lenses will take a full most macro lenses will take a full frame picture of a nickel. So I use two lenses. I use a 200 millimeter and I use a 105 millimeter. Okay. And I ch I shoot with the 200 whenever I can. If I can't get far enough away from my subject, I use the 105. Um, but if most people aren't going to have two lenses. So what I recommend for most people is to buy Sigma makes a 150 macro. I think it's like $800 from Hunt's camera in uh, over on the East Coast. It's a great lens. It's really sharp. It, it's super flexible. You can use it with a crop camera. You can use it with a full frame camera, and it will get down to that full frame picture of a nickel. Okay. Yeah, great lens. So it's not cheap though. 800 bucks, you said. That's cheap. Well, I have a. 600 f4 so that's cheap <laughs> yeah well i know i mean yeah. I, my lenses are expensive too when sure. i first started teaching because i have a weird story because i i wasn't even interested in photography and i got a job at a photography studio so the very first lens i ever bought was 2500 dollars. Huh. so when i started teaching nobody could do anything cool and i was like what's wrong with these people because right. they had the little kit lenses sure yeah. so i bought a kit lens so i could right. relate to them so and yeah. I didn't even understand that they couldn't do all that stuff, you know. I was like, what do you mean you can't blur out the background or whatever? <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. So, and you don't uh, have to buy brand new. And you can buy, you know, eBay and places like that, you can buy a used lens for a few hundred dollars. Okay. So, but the Sigma, if you're going to buy a, a, a new lens. The other thing about macro photography is if you want to just kind of dabble in it and you don't want to invest into a new lens, you can buy extension tubes or close-up adapters. Extension tubes are basically... Uh, just hollow tubes that are a spacer between your lens and your camera and they allow the lens to focus closer. So a lot of people will put a set of extension tubes there and they're less than hundred dollars onto a 70 to 210 or an 80 to 400 and that allows that to get close. You won't get as close as a full frame nickel but you'll be able to do butterflies and frogs and things okay. like that. And, and that's then, a lot less expensive and if it's you a don't, lot less. not sure if you like it or exactly. not. Exactly, you can dip and your And how do you in. know what kind of extension tubes to buy? Just you buy the kind that, that work on your lens if okay. you're a Nikon shooter and then there's also things like Kenco that will make it but you buy it it's specific to the mounting system of your lens. Okay. Yep. And then another option is what's called a close-up diopter and that's basically like a set of reading glasses. That go on that goes on the front of your lens. Oh, okay. And that's less than a hundred dollars, and that will allow you to focus closer. And if you want to get even closer, you can put extension tubes on and a close-up diopter, 
and get even closer. All and right. then when you and those things aren't just useful for that, when you finally fall in love with macro photography, which you all will, uh -huh. then you can use those in conjunction with your macro lens and get even closer still and do full frame pictures of a house fly and headshots and things like that. So now do you lose any quality when you use uh, you lose tubes a little bit of light, you, you know, you light. don't, yeah, it okay. costs you like a full set of extension tubes might cost you one stop of light. Oh, okay. But typically, you know, you're, you're, you're working slower shutter speeds, you're on a tripod, so it's not, it's not that big a deal. Okay. It's not like you're trying to stop a bird in flight or anything, you know. So tripod, pretty important to have a good tripod. A if you want to be a macro photographer, a tripod's because an important thing. any little thing. shake is going to make a huge difference, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. And one of the big challenges with macro photography is, it's God's cruel joke, that the closer you get, the less depth of field, the less zone of sharpness you have. So we're always fighting to get enough depth of field. So one of the ways we can do that is obviously to stop down to F16, F22, but that means we're shooting longer exposures. It's not, people are amazed to hear this, but I often shoot 15, even 20 second exposures. Wow. With my, when I'm doing macro photography. Wow, so you have to have a really good so tripod. You have a tripod, I use the two second timer, I use a cable release. Okay. Yeah. So a tripod's pretty important if you wanna do that kind of thing. All right, so now you've got your equipment. Right. So what's the next step? Well, for me, find a subject. <laughs> find a subject. That would be yeah. And for me, I like to do. Uh, I'm a nature photographer, so I do a lot of insects and flowers and things like that. And um, my favorite kind of macro photography to do, and this can be done up in Michigan pretty easily. Actually, yesterday we could have done it here in Florida. But when, if you want to do insects, when the temperature is below 60 degrees, insects are cold-blooded, so they can't move until they warm up. So you have this willing subject, really cool, tiny little insect, and he can't move until he warms up enough. So that's where I'm doing 15, 20 second exposures. Ah, so I did not even know that about, I don't like bugs. We have lots of bugs down you here. You do have, you have some really <laughs> cool bugs, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I do. I get up really early in the morning, I go out about 45 minutes before the sun comes up. I go out, I set my gear all up, and I go out in a meadow, and I start combing back and forth looking for insects that are in the state of torpor that aren't gonna move. And up in Michigan, and probably here a lot of times, they'll also be all covered with dew. Oh, right? Because yeah. the dew settles yeah, that on would them. Be cool. So it's really neat. And then so I find a subject, find two or three subjects, mark them, and then I come back and photograph them after after I find them. What do you mean by mark them? You just put like a flag there? Or yeah, something? I put yeah, just something, maybe a clothespin or something, because you'll be surprised. Like you'll you'll be combing this metal looking for something for a dewy dragonfly and you'll see one and you'll turn around and you'll look back and, and he's it, there but you he's can't there see but him. you can't see him again. So you want to yeah. make sure you can the find him. The last time again. I was at Corkscrew everybody saw the praying mantis and I'm like, where is it? I'm looking right and I finally yeah. finally saw right, it. Right, yeah. Well that's their job to hide, right? Yeah. 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 So so then, so usually what I do is I get out there, and the reason I get out there early is because I want to find some subjects before the light gets too harsh. So I find a few subjects, mark them, then, then once the light comes up a little bit, then I come out, come back and shoot them. And, then, and actually, once the sun comes out, I'm done. If the sun hits my subject, then we get, get all the contrast and all the shadows and all that. And macro photography, for me, is all about showing those those beautiful little details. Okay. Right. So we want nice, quiet, soft light to really let those details sing. So a cloudy day? Could you do a cloudy day? You could do a cloudy day okay. as well. Yeah. So typically we're looking for a windless, cool morning, and then once this, if the sun gets on our subject, we're we're pretty much done. Or we can well, use then a diffuser. Well, then they warm up too, and, and they then take they off. also warm up. You're exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So I know our little cucarachas down here are very fast. Yeah, <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> we don't like. No, I've, I've actually never photographed one of those. God, they're creepy, creepy <laughs> things. And I don't even know why, you know, like we, ants, are, ants are just as bad, but they don't creep you out as much as I a think it's their lifestyle. You know? Yeah. Ugh, ugh, ugh. I don't, I'm not into bugs at all, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see one all covered with dew, and it's, it's magical. You'd yeah, be into I've that, seen, I think. I've seen a lot of pictures. Yeah. It's up there with Iceland for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so my Iceland trip to go photograph Dewey insects, yeah. you're not in. <laughs> now, because you have such a shallow depth of field, how do you know where to focus? 
that's that's a that's one of the big things. So most people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize this, but you know, when, when we look through our lens, obviously we're looking through it wide open, right? So we see very little depth of field. Then when we take the picture, it's the, the f-stop stops down to whatever we set it at, and that's when we get all of our depth of field, right? Okay. So the trick is, so wherever you focus that lens, a third of the depth of field, the zone of sharpness, a third of that is in front of where you focus, okay. and two thirds is behind where you focus. All right. Right. So, and that's not exact, but it's right. close enough for us. So, what we ideally want to do is we want to focus a third of the way into the image. Okay. Right. Because if you focus on the closest thing, when you stop the lens down, you're going to waste that third of depth of field that's in front of your focus point. So you want to focus a third of the way into your subject. Okay. Then when you stop down, you'll get your depth of field and everything will be sharp. Ah, okay. So you make an educated guess of a third of the way in, or you can actually look at the lens barrel and make a better guess. But So you focus first? Sure, yep. And then you get your settings? Then, I, yeah, I get all my settings. I figure out my, my f-stop and all of that stuff. Then I focus, and I, I generally, I'm almost 90% of the time, I'm focusing manually, right? And you got to remember, your subject is in torpor. If you're doing dewy insects or uh -huh. watch parts or whatever, nothing's moving, right? So you've got plenty of time. What's the word you're using? Torpor. 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 It's like, kind of like hibernation. They just okay. can't, they can't function until they warm up enough. That's a new word for me. Yeah, well, you've got <laughs> seal and all kinds of things. I know. <laughs> so, um, so you've got plenty of time. There's no... Right. There's no hot rush, and, and macro photography is technical. You, you know, you really need to. That's why a tripod's a good thing because it allows you to slow down and pace yourself and take your time and check all the details. But you don't have a gun to your head because, you know, you, you're in, your subject is just sitting there. You got yeah. plenty of time. Make sure you do it. And then, after you take the picture, then look at the back of the camera. The back of the camera is not for checking exposure. The back of the camera is for checking to make sure everything's sharp, mm -hmm. right? So, so I take the picture, then I, I zoom into the picture and I look and I make sure all the wings are sharp and I scroll around and make sure it's all sharp, make sure my composition is good, then I check the histogram for exposure, then if, if I need to tweak something, my subject's still sitting there, I can do it again, Okay. right? And, and, and fix whatever I need to fix. Okay, so what kind of settings are you usually using? If it's a cloudy or you know, if, like if the sun's daybreak not or whatever. Yeah, early morning settings. It's I am kind of dark, right? Well, I, you know, the, the, before the sun comes up, generally where I shoot, I have a line, bank of trees on the east side of the meadow, so I get a fair amount of light from the sky. Okay. But it's not, you know, I'm shooting six second, eight second, fifteen second exposures pretty regularly. Okay. So at f16, f22, ISO 320, 400, something like that. Okay. All right. So. All right, so you're focused about a third of the way in, and and that's going to make everything look kind of in focus, right? It's but you're still going to have soft edges, right? Well, it in depends on especially. how deep your subject, how how it, you know, it depends on how close you are, how much magnification you have, and how much depth you have, right? Okay. So, so uh, depth of field is always a challenge when you're doing macro photography, yeah, that's right? What so when you're it, so let's say you're at at life size, which is that full frame picture of a nickel, uh -huh. okay? If you have a 105 millimeter macro and you're taking a full frame picture of a nickel, you're stopped down to F16, your depth of field is only one millimeter. Okay. So it's really shadow. So when you're working at magnification like that, in the past we were relegated to, to photographing just flat subjects, right? Like a, like a spider web, okay. one plane. Uh, the, the wing scales of a butterfly, right? It's all on one okay. plane. We don't have a lot of depth. Uh -huh. Now, with digital, and I'm not a big computer guy, but with digital, what we do now, what we can do is we can do something called focus stacking. Oh, okay. Which is really exciting for me because I want to photograph some things that aren't flat. I want to photograph the face of a dragonfly, right? Get in there real close, you know, zoom way in and, and get the whole thing sharp. So if we were to do that with one picture, and I'll, I'll give you some examples that you have show notes, right? Yes. So I'll give you some examples of some of these so the viewers can, okay. can see That'd some things and, and see what we're talking about. But if you were to take a full frame picture of a dragonfly's face and you stop down all the way down to F22, uh -huh. the only thing that would be sharp would be one millimeter. Okay. So just the front edge of his face, uh -huh. right? So now, 
In the digital age, now we can do something called focus stacking. And what that is, is we'll take a series of different images at different focus points in the depth of the picture, right? So we take... So you take one picture and you refocus, take the next picture, focus a little differently, focus, just exactly. keep... How many pictures do you take? It depends on, on how much. I've never done more than 12. And there, but there well, are sounds like a lot. There are people that do hundreds. Hundreds? Hundreds, yeah. Wow. Which I think is pretty excessive. But I've never done more than 12. But, um, and then you use a computer program to take, to take you, you put all of these, these images. So say, like, like for the dragonfly example, I took six images. And I'll show you. I'll put together a thing so you can see all six images. Okay. And you, so basically, you focus at the closest thing you want sharp, and then all the way back to the farthest thing away you want sharp. And right. then you take all six of those images, you put them into a computer program, and you push process, and it takes just the sharp bits of all six of those images, com uses those, and makes one picture. That's awesome. It now, is do you pretty have awesome. a specific software you use? There's a couple choices. So you could use Photoshop. I think Photoshop, Photoshop has, focus has stacking something in, in there to do that. Do you know where it is? Uh, no, because no. I don't use Photoshop. It'd probably be in the filters menu or in the where do you stitch panoramics together? It's probably in there. That's under file, merge. Probably something, like, something that. like that, yeah. Okay. So, and then there's two programs that are, you, that are made specifically for focus stacking, and that's Helicon and Zarene. Okay. Those are the two, two programs, and they're like 25 bucks, 30 bucks maybe. Oh, wow, they're cheap. Um, yeah, well, they're pretty, sp pretty oh, specialized. Oh, because they're very specific, that's right. all they do. Right, Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, I use Zarene, which is really easy. Um, the only reason I use it is because it's simple, because I'm not a big computer guy. Um, and uh, you can buy it, you can get a 30 day free trial and try them both out and see which one you like. But, uh, and it just like literally, I just drag and drop them into the box and hit stack. And then you get the super and sharp picture. And you get the super sharp picture all the way through. Yeah. That's awesome. So, now, generally, when we're working at magnification, you, you mentioned changing the focus. Yeah. Okay, when we're working at high magnifications like that, we actually don't turn the focus a lot. We actually move the camera forward and backward to focus on something called a rail. Oh, so if you you're have working another at piece of equipment that exactly. goes on the tripod that goes and then on, the so camera goes on the rail? Exactly, and then when you turn the dial, the camera moves forward and back. And when you're working at magnification, like serious, like full frame dragonfly magnification, uh -huh. that's where you, where you use the rail to focus. Okay, like some, some macro lenses don't even have a focus ring. The only uh -huh. way to focus is to move it back and forth. But if so, you're moving it back and forth, aren't you messing your composition up? No, because it's just tiny little movements. I mean, uh, like, it's just a, a couple millimeters. Okay. Or, you know, it's just really small movements. And what's that rail system called or whatever? It's called a focusing rail. Focusing rail. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now... And what does it have, like, a tripod plate? Right, yep. So, so the rail mounts on your tripod, then your camera mounts on, your, on, the, on the top of the rail, and then there's a gear that moves the camera forward and backward. But just a little itsy-bitsy, teeny You can move bit. it as little bit as, okay. as you need to. Yep, it's ah. really fine and precise. So that's one way to do it, and that's a great way to do it. Now, there's a company called Cognosys, okay. which makes this, this thing called a stack shot, which is a, it's a mechanical rail that will will do all of this for you and it's very precise because if we're doing it ourselves we're guessing yeah, at how much we're exactly. moving it forward and backward so the 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 stack shot rail does all that for you so basically so let's say i'm let's use my dragonfly example again so we want to get it sharp from the, the front of his face all the way back to the back of his eyes say okay so the first thing we do is is there's a little button on there that moves the camera back and forth so we pull it back to the face is sharp, and we set that as, as our starting point. Okay. Then we push the, push the button and move the camera mechanically forward to the back of the eye, and we say that's our end spot. Okay. And then the rail's gonna say, okay, how many pictures do you wanna make? So you program that, and like for this one, I did six pictures, and I said, okay, make six pictures, and it says, okay, are we all set, can we start? <laughs> and then you push start, and it goes, Brr, it moves the camera back to the start position and takes a picture. Then it moves forward and then it settles for a couple seconds. So all the vibration stops, ah. takes another picture, moves it forward, and it does all the math and it's super precise 
it's really great. It works really, really well. And that's really, its really own well. rail system. And that's its own and rail system. how much system. does that cost, do you know? I think it's about 500 bucks. So it's not cheap. So it's not cheap. What's a regular one cost that you do manually? You can get one used for 30 bucks. 30? On eBay, yeah. Wow. So eBay, eBay, eBay is our friend. <laughs> eBay is our friend. Yeah, but and and even but like if you buy like a, a really right stuff, a really their high end rail, it's two or three hundred bucks. So my, you know, but you, you can well get the you may as well get the stack shot and have a lot more shot capability. Is the name of it. It's Cognosis stack shot. It's and really we'll put a, all this in the show notes. Oh, that'd be great. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and I've got pictures of that for you. I can send you too. Wow. So but. But just that whole part, that's macro on steroids. Yeah. Right? Most people aren't going to... I never even heard of some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's fun. I mean, the, the beauty of that is it kicks open so many creative doors. Like, think about it. I was relegated to doing just flat subjects, dragonfly wings, butterfly wings. Now yeah. I can do things with depth. Now I can, you know... It just it, it opens up a lot of creative doors. It's really super exciting. That is so cool. Right. So, but for most people, you know, you're not going to start off doing that. You're going to buy a Sigma 150 or a used macro lens. You're going to get a camera. You're going to go out. You're going to start doing butterflies. You're going to do caterpillars and watch parts, whatever it is you uh -huh. want to photograph. Uh -huh. And then. After you do it for a while, you're going to get sucked down this other rabbit yeah. hole. Photography yeah, photography is not a cheap thing to do. <laughs> no, Especially well, the more you get into it, the more you want more stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. It's you all think, about... think, okay, I'll just get everything I need and I'll be done. No, that never no, happens. $100 <laughs> you to death, yeah. Yeah, yeah $100 But it's fun. But, I mean, that's what happens. You, you, you know, you, you start figuring out, okay, well, I want to make a picture of this, and then you get sucked down that rabbit hole. And, but that's the fun of it. Right? Yeah. 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 So. Now, what other kind of things do you use, like for equipment or like, you know, what Heather wrote in this, the plant? That's for, more for plants, right? I guess. Well, the plant is, uh, it's a basically a two clamps, a clamp on one end, a clamp on the other end, and it's made by the Wimberly Company, and it's got an articulating arm between the two clamps super useful so you can clamp one onto your tripod and you can clamp a flower into the other end and use that to hold your, your thing you can your your subject that you're photographing you can use it to hold another flower in your picture you can use it to hold a reflector i use a reflector a lot when i'm doing like if i'm out in the field doing macro photography mm -hmm. you know again I'm, I'm out there before the sun comes up so before the sun the sun's behind the tree so my subject's in the shade so all the light is coming from above right because mm -hmm. the sky becomes the light source so I'll use a reflector to bounce some of that light from the sky onto my subject. Okay. So I've got my subject down here. I've got either I'm holding it like holding it with my hand or I have the plant holding the reflector and then I'm looking through my camera to take the picture and that just lights up that subject. Are you mostly using a reflector for lighting or do you use If I'm from if I'm out in the field probably 90% of the time. Okay. I'm using a reflector again cuz all the lights coming from above so I need to bounce some onto my subject. Yep. And you use a, just a white reflector? Silver? Well, I use a two-sided, so it's uh -huh. either white and gold on the other side. And if I want a warmer light, I'll use a gold side. And if I want a pretty neutral light, I'll use the white side. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are now using uh, Hunt cells, these little LED uh, light sources. They're basically like a little cube that throws some LED light out. Uh -huh. and they're like 50 bucks. Um, and those work really well because they'll, they'll throw a little bit more light and give you some more light. I don't use those when I'm dealing with, with dewy subjects, though, because you'll get the, the, the light will make little highlights and all the little dewdrops. You can it's see the little square in there. Exactly, yeah. 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 It's a little, a little distracting. Yeah. So, but for things that aren't covered with dew, those things work really well as well. Oh, that's nice. That's good to know, too. Yeah, yeah. it's a handy little tool. But they're not too bright then, right? Well, some of them have. You can dial up or down the brightness. You don't want it too bright because you don't want it to look like you flashed it. Right. right? You, you want, want to make it look like natural light. light. You just want to balance yeah. it exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. That is cool. Any other equipment that you get, that you use? That's um, kinda, I'm learning a lot about all the different equipment. Well, you've got extension tubes. You've got diopters. Um, a cable release is super handy, right? So you, you're not pushing the button. You're not touching your camera. You're firing your with the cable release and that yeah, allows you've it. got the slow shutter you've speed. You've got slow shutter you speeds and pictures. right. So you can use the timer, right? You can put your camera on two second delay, push the button, let go, everything settles down and takes a picture. But the problem with the, the drawback to that is a lot of times again, I'm out in the meadow early in the morning, we're doing a, a four second exposure, we can't have any wind. 
right? If the wind blows my subject during that four seconds, it's going to be. So a lot of times you'll be sitting there waiting for the wind to die. Oh. And if you're using the two second timer, you push the button, sure enough, when it actually makes the exposure, the wind is picked oh. up. So a cable uh -huh. release works around Do you that. do anything to block the wind? Or? Sometimes, yeah, I'll, I'll put up a diffuser or something like that to block the wind. Well, she's praying. <laughs> you stop blowing. <laughs> Now, okay, so you live out in the boonies. Yeah, I'm well, I'm, I'm, so I'm not totally in the boonies, but <laughs> I, I have a very nice wild house, yes. That's awesome. So yeah. you said you have a favorite meadow that you go to for macro. Are you mostly looking for bugs, or you, do you have flowers? Do you do... Uh, all of that, yeah. All of the above? Yeah, all of the above, yeah, and, and you know, wherever that, that may... But to, for, for doing the, the dewy insects early in the morning, that's a specific meadow. You know, I'm looking for a meadow that's that's got uh, a wall of trees on the east side, so it, it blocks that sun, because I don't want the sun coming into my meadow okay. and, and, and making too much contrast. Um, and it's gonna have a, a, a good bunch of wildflowers and things like that that are gonna attract the insects. And you know that's what I'm looking for. And for the first 15 years of my career when I was doing macro photography, I worked in a little three acre meadow five minutes from my house and did some really cool stuff. I mean, you don't have to, that's the other thing about macro photography, you don't have to travel around the world. You can, yeah. you know, you can work in one little meadow or you can bring these things, you know, you can bring, you can go to the florist and buy flowers and do, you know, little pieces and parts of the flowers. You can do patterns of leaves. The subject matter is just infinite. Yeah, you know Lisa Kuchera? No, I'm not familiar. Anyway, she does, like, she brings little lizards and she's got, like, a collection of cre creepy little things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not a nature photographer. <laughs> I actually, I love landscape photography. Well, there you go. I, yeah, yeah, I'm right. like a, I'm a hiker in the, I yeah. love the Everglades, but. Oh, yeah, there you but go. But I'm not. You're not, so. not bugs and lizards and amphibians. Yeah. And I never was afraid until the python got a little, well, they're I'm not a little that nervous. <laughs> they just got an 18-foot one. Did they? Yeah. Oh, my that goodness. That was the record. That was last week, Yeah, that's I a think. terrifying thing. That's, yeah, yeah, I'm that's scared of them. I'm not afraid happen. of alligators too much or cottonmouth snakes even because you leave them alone, but those pythons sure. are aggressive. Right, yeah. But bugs, yeah, I don't like bugs. Right. <laughs> so do... Is bug behavior like bird behavior? Like all the bird photographers I know, they learn everything about birds and know the behavior. Oh, sure. he's going to poop. He's going to take off. He's going to do this. That's, you know? Yeah, those are the. Is is it the same thing for bugs? Um, well, there's such a diversity of bugs that you know you, you it, they all have such diverse behaviors. But I mean, that's we all love to photograph. Behavior. Any nature photographer, I love photographing elk. I love photographing an elk standing there in a regal pose, oh, but. Yeah. I'd much rather photograph two elk fighting or right. mating or, you know, whatever. The, be, the behavior is something we always try to photograph because that's just a little more interesting. So the bugs, you have, do you have to learn their behavior? To, well, you have to learn their behavior to know where they're going to be. Sure, yeah. You want to know their plants, what plants they're on and things like that. But they don't have, you know, the same types of is evolved of behaviors of some of the other, other subjects. But, yeah. So, the, like anything, the more you know about the subject, the better you're going to be able to, to photograph it. And the more things you're going to know to try to capture, like, oh, there's some bird. I can't, is, is it a snipe? I don't think it's a snipe. But his eyes stick out beyond his head, so uh -huh. he can see behind him. He, you know, he can see almost 360 degrees because his eyes stick out beyond the, his head. Unless you knew that, you would know to get a photograph of that bird from behind to show his eyes to demonstrate that specific thing about that bird. So, you know, it's like anything. The more you know about your subject, the better, better like you're going to photograph it. like a mother, right? Moms have eyes in the back of their head, that's, right? Isn't that's, that? that's what it is. It's a mother bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you must have met my mother. <laughs> in fact, she just, she knows I'm talking about her right now. <laughs> All right, so what <clears throat> is advanced macro photography? Well, so advanced macro photography would be, you know, getting in closer. Okay. Right, so doing the dragonfly sets, doing focus stacking, doing things like that. So once you start getting in, the closer you get, the more technical it gets, the more, you know, you, you need to throw some more equipment at it, some, some extension tubes, some close-up diopters. Canon, I'm a Nikon guy, uh -huh. I love, my Nikons, but Canon has this incredible lens called, it's, excuse me, it's an MP65E. Okay. 
Okay. And it's a macro lens, but it's a macro lens on steroid. It's a, it's actually a macro zoom lens. So it goes from one X, which these are terms to describe how close you're getting. So one X is a full frame picture of a nickel. Okay. Right. So this zoom lens goes from a full frame picture of a nickel, one X, all the way to five X. So five X is a full frame eyeball of a dragonfly. Oh wow. Right. So it's but it's super specific. It's only for that. And I actually bought a Canon camera so I could use this lens. Oh my gosh. So it's it's a really a, a cool lens and it kicks open a lot of doors. It's really hard to work with, but it's again, it's about, you know, opening up some different creative doors. But when you're doing it with that lens, again, that's a lens we're talking about a lens that doesn't have a focus ring. That lens has no focus ring. Because okay. it's all extreme macro. So again, you're focusing by moving the camera closer or further away. Wow. And when you're working on magnifications like that, you really need the stack shot, the, the, the yeah. automatic rail to, to stack the images. Because when you're, you know, at 5x, there's no depth of field. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. And is that what micro photography is? Well, micro, uh, well, there's, well, that's extreme macro photography. Then there's also micro, microscopic, I don't know what the word, I'm, it's, it's slipping my mind right now. But basically, it's using a microscope to take pictures. And I worked on a project where I photographed, this was, I don't know, almost a decade ago now, but I photographed snowflakes, individual oh, snowflakes. Oh, that would be fun. It was really, well, there, you just got it. Is that what it. you're doing? <laughs> no, you're not doing no. How do you? How do you do it? So, yeah, so I actually, I built a, a microscope to do that. So okay. I hooked my camera up to a microscope objective and made a big stand, and then it was all outside, right, because uh -huh. it's got to stay cold. Right. You can't do this in Florida, but. No. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, and then I would, I would have a sheet of black velvet, and I would catch the snowflakes on the black velvet, and I would look at them with a little hand loop, and then I would, when I found a really pretty one, I would pick it up with, I would had a, a paintbrush with just one or two hairs on it, and I would pick each snowflake up with the, with the, the two hairs of the paintbrush, and I'd put it on a slide, a microscope slide, and I'd bring it over to my camera, put it underneath my, my oh setup, my and then I would photograph it, and I used fiber optics to light it. And, and how do they don't break? No, if you well, you have to be very careful, but yeah, wow. but they're beautiful. And how do you even see them to do that? Oh, you do it through the. You have a little tiny microscope. magnifying, and then you you know once you get them underneath there, then you you focus you know and by moving it up and down. And they don't melt because it's cold. Well, they actually will over you know in a couple minutes they'll actually sublimate. Okay. which is kind of like evaporate. Okay. So you have to kind of work fast, but wow. it was a super cool project. It was, and they were, they're so beautiful. Yeah. And what kind of lights? Uh, I used fiber optic lights. The lighting was actually the hard part. The building microscope was surprisingly the easier part that, because you can't have any heat, right? So, cause they'll melt and pretty soon you'll be doing a, a water drop. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I found these fiber optic lights that have arms. So the light source is in this little box and then there's a fiber optic tube that pipes the light in and you could I could you know move it around and wow it was neat it was a fun project that's yeah, yeah. you got all kinds of stuff going on don't you <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't sleep much <laughs> jeez what about water drops so water drops yeah I've, I've done some uh dew drops on spider webs and things like that which is really fun and again that's pretty extreme macro photography um but uh yeah, and I, I, a lot of times I'll focus stack that too because you just don't, when you're working at those extreme magnifications, you don't have the uh, the depth of field. To now, do you show up in the water drop, like your reflection though, or the camera reflection? It's or? actually whatever's behind is what shows up. Oh, okay. Right, so whatever's behind, the, like I have a picture, I call it crystal balls, and I'll send this to you for your show notes. It's called crystal balls, and it's a bunch of, of dew drops on a spider web, and inside each of the dew drops you can see a flower and the flower is actually behind the dew drops and you can ah. see the pink from the center and then the petals coming off and then each one of those drops acts like a lens and focuses the flower in that's cool yeah it is it's really fun and creative yeah where else would you do water drops just on plants and spider webs Plants, spider webs, you know, I'm actually working on a project where I've got an idea in my head for some water drops using high speed flash that I want to, I want to photograph water drops dropping into a specific plant, but 
we'll have to talk we'll about that. We'll see how that time. goes yeah, first. That's, <laughs> that's in my head. That's that's what I do my whole life is I try to make all the all the pictures I have bouncing around in my head. I you know what I always tell people when I'm teaching, you know, I have I have all these in my slides, I put terrible pictures. Right. Because I have all these brilliant ideas that don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I had this great idea, and this is what happened. But if you don't try. No, you got to try. Sometimes right? yeah. they work yeah, out. You got to push the boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's the fun. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that, that since the advent of digital photography, there's so many great photographers out there, and they're making so many great images. And it's hard to show people something they haven't seen before, mm -hmm. right? Because there's that's for sure. And that's what I love about doing the crazy technical, you know, snowflakes. How many people photograph snowflakes? Super high speed Mac or super high speed flash, freezing hummingbirds and bats in flight and things like that. These are things that you can do that not everybody's doing, and you can kind of show people things that they can't see with their naked eye like the high magnification stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And that's cool. that's the fun stuff. So yeah, are you going like. to prime your um, what are you calling this nature what? Your The Nature Photography Institute. The Nature Photography Institute. Are you going to prime your um, location with like bird feeders and to try to attract they're, they're, all the They're already up. You're already yeah, going, they're, man. They're Do you have hummingbirds up. in Michigan? We have one hummingbird. Yeah. Oh. So we have the ruby-throated hummingbird, okay. which is a beautiful bird. Yeah. But we're going to have we have flying squirrels and Pileated woodpeckers you and all kinds of birds. You have cute foxes too. I remember that. From we me. have a fox that's that's living. We, I Nicole love and I have seen I it a few times. I think they are so cute. They are very. They're like that. A, might uh, make me come to Michigan to get one of the foxes in the snow. Okay. I love those they pictures. Look, yeah, those are beautiful. And God, they've got. And again, so see, they have their best coat on. They look. Yeah, yeah I they do look love really those. Good. Yeah. Foxes are. I don't think we have foxes down here. Oh, sure you do. Yeah. Do we? Do we? I've never yeah. seen one. Yeah, they're not as beautiful as Michigan fox because they don't have the same coat. I probably think they're dogs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at I remember that red the first cat. time I saw, and I've lived in Florida most of my life, but the first time I saw a deer, I thought it was a dog because they're so small here, you know? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Was it a key deer, maybe? Yeah. So walk us through a workshop. What's your favorite workshop that you put on? Oh, well, that's impossible. Um, well, so, so Nicole and I do two different experiences. So we do workshops, right, which okay. is a hands-on learning experience. Usually it's a long weekend. We go to the Smoky Mountains, we go to Yellowstone, we go to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. You come to the Nature Photography Institute at our house, we teach you macro photography. And Are you gonna have a, like a bed and breakfast there too? or We're gonna have hotels. Okay. <laughs> yeah, ah. We're not gonna have a hotel, ah. but, but we're gonna have a classroom area and all of that, but we're not gonna house people. You're not gonna house yeah, them, okay. No. So, but, but those experiences are usually like a weekend long, total immersion photography totally learning we we just we take you out in the field we show you how to make pictures we help you identify and solve problems and 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 just basically become a better photographer so that's one experience and those are usually in north america the places like i mentioned then we also do big grandiose trips like and those are called photo tours and those are the places like Tanzania and Kenya and the Galapagos Islands and Ecuador and, and big giant trips like that. And those are super fun. Those are generally people are more familiar with their equipment. Mm -hmm. And we take you to these amazing locations. Make sure you're, you know, all of our locations that we do are completely pre-scouted. So we make sure that we've got great guides. We take you to the right places. You're at the right place at the right time okay. to get all the, yeah. all the really cool stuff. So, yeah. So, so, so your, but your question was my favorite. I don't know. Like for photo tours, Costa Rica, I've been to Costa Rica a dozen times, and I love Costa Rica. There's such a diversity of things to photograph from poison dart frogs to hummingbirds to sloths and monkeys and all of that stuff. And the people are really, really neat people. They, they, they are super proud of their country, and they want to share it with you. And, and they'll, you know, they'll see you walking with a big camera. And they're like, oh, come here, come here. There's a resplendent cuts all up here. And oh. they, they want to they wanna share it with you. So that's really fun. Um, and then, you know, you got places like Tanzania and Kenya that are super cool, but they're, you know, they're cool because they're epic and, yeah. you know, big. You know, it's just it's, you're living what you watched on National Geographic. Right, yeah. So those are fun. But then... You know, the workshops, when we go down to the Smokies, we all, the whole entire groups, we rent a, uh, a cabin. Uh, it's a big giant log cabin. It's like 3,500 square feet with a theater room and everything. And during that workshop, 
the whole entire group stays together in this giant cab, and, nice. and it's it's just really fun. There's a lot of camaraderie. And How many people go on your work tours or workshops? Or? So workshops are typically smaller, uh -huh. right? Because it's more hands-on. You know, so those are usually six. Maybe now that Nicole's with me helping me, we might be able to get eight and okay. be able to give everybody the attention they need. And then tours are just a little bit bigger. You know, maybe ten. The Galapagos, we have to fill a boat, so that's you yeah. know a total of sixteen. But okay. usually, usually ten for a tour, and usually six or eight for a workshop. Okay. Yeah. What's coming up next? Oh, next we go. Um, I think we're going to Mexico to do to the Angongueo uh, Mountains to do the monarch migration. Five acres covered with monarch, every inch of every tree, just wow. epic. So that'll be really cool. And, and then, when is that? That's in February. Do you have openings? We don't. No, okay. that one's full. And then, uh, then we're going to Costa Rica. We're doing two trips to Costa Rica this year. The first one is going to be in the cloud forest. So that's birds and sloths and, 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 and uh, poison dart frogs and things like that. And then we bring our high-speed hummingbird thing, so you can do high-speed hummingbird photography too. And then we're going to the Osa Peninsula, which is, I like to say, is the wild heart of, of Costa Rica. It's on mm -hmm. the... It's right there. The whole entire peninsula is a uh, is a national park. It's just it's amazing. So that'll be macaws and more poison and that's dart frogs. And that's in I'm sorry, that's in the end of March, first part of April. And we do have openings in that. Okay. And then we're doing Kenya. We're going back to Tanzania. We're going to a new trip that we're just opening up is Newfoundland to do puffins. Ooh, do you know puffins and, I love and puffins. Gannets. They're so cute. Aren't they common? Yeah, they're really fun. So, and then we're going to Brazil and Galapagos. That's and all this year? That's all 2019. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know when we're gonna be able to, <laughs> to photograph our new house. So, uh, yeah, and, and how are you gonna fun. set up the Photography Institute, Nature Well, Wait, we work hard. There's the two of, of us, too. Yeah, we, we're very nice. hard workers, yeah. Wow. So, and then for workshops, we're doing the Smokies. We're gonna do winter in Yellowstone and lots of stuff, so. Yeah, but it's fun. It's what we love. It's, and, and we never work, right? Because we're well, just having like fun. Well, it sounds like you work hard to me. Oh, it's fun. <laughs> but it's just like a bug part. It. It's work, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't for those darn bugs, we wouldn't even hardly have a job. <laughs> so, what, how do people find you? What's your website? Uh, the website is, is stevegettle.com. Steve Gettle. Gettle. G e t t l e. Gettle.com. And then Nicole and I have a great Facebook page. Uh, we do photo tip Fridays. Uh, we do a lot of, of education through Facebook. And then both Nicole and I both have Instagram. It's Steve Gettle, at Steve Gettle, and then at Nicole Suddeth, S U D D U T H. And what's the Facebook? The Facebook is uh, Steve Gettle uh, Nature Photography. We're Steve Gettle Nature Photography. Is, yeah, I think so. I'm not exactly sure. But if you search me, I'll come up. And I'll put, we'll put it in the show yeah, notes, well, too. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll tag you on Facebook, too. Awesome. <laughs> That'll Great. help, thank too. You. Yeah. So. Oh, really well, thank it. you for coming. Thank you for being in Florida. Thank you very much. And being on the show. Yeah, appreciate I appreciate it. you having me. Thank you. I'm Peggy Farron. Join us next week for another episode of the Understand Photography Show. Thanks for watching.